want some advice, you should check that Facebook notification right there. It's way more important than whatever you're doing. <laughs> well, good morning. Second time I've seen that and it's still funny. I like it. Well, my name's Eric. Happy New Year. Uh, I am thrilled to be here with you. If you're a regular attender, you're probably wondering who in the world is that guy. Um, like I said, my name's Eric. I, over the last several weeks, I've gotten to know the leadership here at LifeBridge Church. We've uh, gotten to be friends. We had some uh, common connections, and uh, they invited me to be here with you, and I'm thrilled to be here with you this morning to kick off uh, not just a new year, but a new sermon series called Bad Advice. Uh, I thought it was funny when they told me what we were going to be talking about over the next several weeks. Um, bad advice makes me think of uh, social media. Uh, I don't know if anybody has had the same experience as me, but every once in a while I'll be scrolling through Facebook or something, and, and somebody will post something, and maybe they're just going through a tough time, and, you know, God bless them. I don't, they're, they really just, they're looking for an encourage, encouraging word or, or something from a friend, and, and they'll post, you know, something that they're struggling with, and, um, and sometimes the advice that people give on Facebook, boy, I, I read it, and I'm like, ooh, no, 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 don't, please don't do that, uh, and, and I'm so tempted to click reply and, and use that little hand that points up to the comment before mine and be like, no, 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 don't, don't do that, uh, but then I'm reminded that usually when you disagree with people on social media, it doesn't go so well. They don't, they don't care for it. Um, so instead, I just kind of back away and kind of go, oh, I hope they figured that, figure out on their own that that's not the best advice. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we all have received some bad advice at a time, or one time or another in our lives, right? And, and if you're like me, maybe you can think of some times that maybe you've even been the person that gave someone bad advice. I can think of times in my life where I'm, I meant well, um, but I, I, somebody came to me and asked me for advice, and I, I told them something, and I think back about it, and I'm like, boy, I hope that they don't remember that it was me that told them to do that. Um, so we've all experienced this. The, the problem sometimes when you're in a situation where you need advice is, it's hard to tell whose advice is good and whose advice is bad. So what we're going to do over the next several weeks, uh, starting today, is we're going to be over the top with this. We're going to be sarcastic. It's, it's, it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. We're going to be um, extreme about giving you bad advice. And here's the thing. Uh, when, you, when you listen to the bad advice, uh, if you really think about what's happened in your life in the past or, or maybe even right now what you're going through, I think we'll realize sometimes that we do these things, and when I make it so plain and sarcastic, it sounds silly, uh, but at times in our life, we, we really are following bad advice uh, by doing some of the things that we do in our lives. So uh, before we get to the bad advice, I want to talk about a parable that Jesus used uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, he, he talked about a sower. A sower was like a farmer back in those days who had a, a big bag of seed, and they would cast this seed out uh, far and wide to see if they could get a, a good uh, crop. Uh, so Jesus tells about this sower who casts this seed out, and he says there was four different types of soil that this seed fell on. The first, uh, the first type was uh, the, fe this, the seed fell along the path. Uh, and, and there was no way for the seed to take root and grow. So the birds came along and picked it up and ate it and stole it. And it didn't even have a chance to take root. The second type fell on rocky soil to where the, it could take root, kind of grow around the rocks. And, but it wasn't very strong. And so the sun came up and scorched it and killed it. And it didn't last the next seed fell among thorns, uh, and the thorns reached around and choked out the life of that seed. And then the fourth 
seed fell on good soil. And, th- and this, is, uh, this is what we hope to find in ourselves. See, the, the thing is, the seed that Jesus was talking about was the word of God. And the four types of soil, uh, that's you and I. Um, and, and somewhere in that parable, wherever you're at in life right now, you'll find yourself. So let's look at Jesus' explanation of this parable. Uh, later on in that chapter, Matthew 13, verse 19, Jesus begins to explain the parable. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So anytime that the word of God, the word of the kingdom, as verse 19 calls it, any time that this word goes out, surely someone who hears it, it just sits there, and, and maybe this is you this morning, just sits there and, and you think, wow, that just is meaningless to me. It, it has no effect on me. You just, you're sitting here thinking, boy, I can't wait till this service is over, uh, till this goofy guy gets off the stage, and we can go, and what's for lunch, and uh, just anything that you can think about other than what the Bible is talking about, what we're reading in Scripture, right? When, when the Word of God goes out and falls on deaf ears, um, that is the first type of soil. And the birds come, it says, the evil one comes and steals it away. It never takes root in your heart. The next verse, verse 20, says, as for what was sown on rocky ground... This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, he immediately falls away. So, so this, is, this is the person that, that gets so excited about the newest and best thing, uh, whatever it might be in their life. They got a new job. They got a new uh, a, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, new car, uh, they, they, they start their life of faith, a new, whatever it is going on in their life, they're just, you talk to them and they're so excited, and maybe this is you, and then it only takes a day or two, and man, I don't really like that new car anymore, it's, you, you'd, be, you'd be surprised how many problems it has, or I'd, I don't like the way it feels, or, you know, this guy or this girl that I was dating, you know, it turns out that they're you know, human, and, and that's tough. Um, so, you know, in and, and this life of faith, you know, so somebody told me it was, it was going to be great, and everything would be rosy, and it would be easy, and, and it's just not the case. And, and if somebody promised you that, they were wrong. My wife sent me a funny text a, a few days ago that said, is one of those memes that was, you know, that moment when, and it said that moment when you realize that somebody told you the Christian life was easy peasy lemon squeezy, and then you get in the middle of it and you read your Bible and you're living this life and you realize it's really difficult, difficult, lemon difficult. And, and if somebody told you it was going to be easy, they weren't exactly truthful. It's great, and it can be wonderful. But nobody promised that it would be easy. And if you let difficulty steal that from you, then verses 20 and 21 are talking about you. In verse 22, Jesus says, As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So this is the person who is really meaning well, and, and, and they, they come to church, and, and they, they, they really want to follow God, and they, they want their faith to flourish, but, but there's bills to pay, and there's money to be made, and, and there's so much going on in life that it just makes it hard. And, and all this worry and all this stress and all everything that goes into life 
kind of takes the joy out of them, makes them lose their faith. If you can relate to that this morning, then maybe verse 22 is describing you. And then finally in verse 23, Jesus says, As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirtyfold. So my prayer for you today is that as we talk about these different situations and we try to figure out maybe, and at one time or another, we've all found ourselves maybe in each of these situations, but, but my prayer for you today in 2018 on this very first Sunday is that you relate to being that, that good soil, that your heart is ready to receive what God has for you uh, and that it takes root in your life and it grows strong and that God does wonderful things in your life in 2018 and onward, okay? So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm married. My wife's name is Stacy. She's here somewhere in the dark this morning. We have two children, uh, Carter and Jocelyn. They're 11 and 5. They're wonderful. Um, I live in Monroe, Michigan, not too far from here. Uh, my wife and I are both born and raised there. Uh, I went to college at a little school called Lee University down in Cleveland, Tennessee. Um, and I can remember when I was first in college, the, the first year or two, um, I would, I had a busy schedule. I, I played golf in college, so I'd, um, I, I would go to, we'd be in the gym in the mornings, we'd go to class all day long, we'd go to the golf course in the afternoon, which I know sounds like a drag to most of you, and it's, when you have to do it every day and it's required, it's not as fun as if you like skip out on work every afternoon and go golfing. It's just not, I found quickly, it's not the same. Uh, but this was, this was my schedule every day. Um, and my wife and I, we weren't married at the time yet. Uh, we were dating. Um, so I would, on Friday afternoons, I would have been in the gym early in the morning. I would go to class all day. I would uh, be at the golf course for practice for several hours. And sometime in the evening, I would hop in my car, and I would get on I-75 northbound, and I would start driving home uh, to see my family and to see Stacy. And I would do this because our... For one, our relationship was new and it was great. And, and when you love someone, you do whatever it takes to spend time with them and, and nourish that relationship, right? With, and and I, so I would drive uh, about 500 miles north to see her. And, and as I did this, I probably drove this hundreds of times. One time in particular, uh, I was driving north um, on I-75, and I was in Kentucky. There's one place in all of the 500 miles between Cleveland, Tennessee, and Monroe, Michigan, on 75, there's one place when you're headed north where there's an exit that goes left instead of right. One place. And it doesn't go left into a little town where there's a gas station and, a, and a, like Wendy's. It goes left onto another expressway where you go in the complete wrong direction uh, if you're not paying close enough attention. So, so I'm driving along, and I used to kid, you know, when, when I get on 75 in Cleveland and drive north, my car it goes on autopilot because I've done this so much. So I was just driving along, driving north, I thought, um, and just cruising along, you know, more than halfway home anxious to get home, and, and uh, all of a sudden, a skyline of a city starts rising, and, uh, and I'm like, hmm, yeah, I don't remember that city. I don't, I don't, matter of fact, I'm not, where am I? What am I, what am I doing? Which direction am I driving? Um, and what had happened was, uh, somewhere in autopilot in Kentucky, uh, I kind of veered off to the left, and uh, I must have blinked or fallen asleep or something as I was driving. And, uh, and it's one of those, every, every time I've driven this since, I've paid attention and I've noticed. And, and you, if you've ever made this drive and you, and you know what I'm talking about, it's like three whole lanes that go left. Uh, it's, it's not subtle. 
Okay, it's a it's a pretty big exit that goes and you and you leave 75 and you go uh, kind of northwest. And if you don't pay attention for long enough, what I found out is you end up in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, nice place if you mean to go there. Uh, I did not mean to go there. Um, so w I was here. I was in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I had unknowingly kind of wandered off path. I had just drifted off, didn't realize it. Um, and all of a sudden, I was like, well, well, how did that happen? Where am I, for one, and how did that happen? So I had got off a little exit, and this was, um, <coughs> this was uh, before the time where you had GPS on your phone. So like the, the, the lady in there wasn't yelling at me to turn around and recalculating route. There wasn't, that didn't exist back then. So I got off, found a little gas station, paid for a map, on paper, some of you you remember what those are, right? Paid for a map, figured out where in Kentucky am I, and then what direction do I need to go to get back on track and, and go home. Um, so what had happened is I just kind of wandered off, didn't pay close enough attention. Uh, you know, I didn't have my hands at 10 and 2. I wasn't paying attention to the signs. I was just kind of comfortable making this drive. I had done it for so long. Um, and maybe you can relate to that. Maybe, maybe this has happened to you. Um, and if it's not happened to you, first of all, leave me alone. <clears throat> Second of all, uh, I bet that even, even more likely is that this has happened to you in your spiritual life, right? Because we can just be going along, doing the things that we are used to doing, and we can just get complacent, right? We can just not be paying as close of attention. Uh, and and how, how does that happen? Well, the Bible has something to say about it. Hebrews 2, verse 1 says, So we must listen very carefully to the truth that we have heard, very carefully, or we may drift away from it. So if we're not very careful, if we're not diligent about what direction we're headed and where we're going and what we're doing, you can find yourself in spiritual Louisville, Kentucky. And I, I'm not even sure what that means. I, don't, I hope nobody's from Louisville, Kentucky in a room where they're like, it's not that bad of a place. Um, the point is, it wasn't where I needed to be at the time, uh, but it's where I ended up. Okay, so how does that happen? Well, Here's where it gets a little fun. Here's where we run into the bad advice. So if, so if you're entering 2018 and you're excited and you're on fire and you're, God is doing wonderful things in your life and you read your Bible and it just God speaks to you and you pray and it feels like he's right there listening and you serve in the church and you're, and you're sharing your faith with people, if all that is happening and you're tired of it, you're tired of everything just going well. And you're wondering, <clears throat> in 2018, how might I drift further from God? That would be great. Uh, five things you can do to drift from God, all right? Here's number one. Neglect your time with God. 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6 says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you, listen to this, to fan it into flame, the gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. This is Paul talking to his protege Timothy, saying, this gift of faith is in you. You just have to work at it a little bit and fan it into flame. Well, if you're starting 2018 and, and, and this flame is just roaring in you, don't keep fanning it. Ignore it. Treat it, it, it. The Bible says it's a gift. This faith is a gift. Treat it like the gifts that you get like from grandma at Christmas time. You know, the things you open and you're like, oh, grandma, this is great. This, and as soon as she looks away, you look at mom and dad and you're like, what is this? I don't even know what this is. But when grandma comes around at your house later, you pull it out, right? You, you want grandma to know you really appreciate that gift. You're not sure what, you still don't know what it does, what it is, what, 
I'm not sure. But I, I throw it in the back of the closet. But when grandma comes over, we, we get it out and we talk about it. And if you really want to... If you really want to hurt your relationship with God, treat it like that, that kind of gift where you just shove it in the back of the closet and, you know, if grandma comes over, we'll talk about our faith, that's fine. But other than that, we just kind of ignore it. That would be really effective. Thing number two, hang around with the wrong people because the right kind of people might be like encouraging, they might uh, uplift you in your faith. If you're struggling with something, they might... Uh, They might help you. They might pray for you. Uh, Who wants that, right? 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. So if you have a good character problem and you're wanting to get rid of it, find yourself some bad company. That would be fantastic. You know, the, the people that you work with that are like, they can find the negative in everything, Invite them over for dinner every night. That would be really helpful, right? And not, not to try and encourage them, but to let them influence you. Let's see how negative you can get. If you just surround yourself with, with negative people who just see the worst in everything, right? Thing number four. Ah, three. I did this in the first service. I really struggled with counting I skipped number four earlier. It's, I, I went to school for theology. You don't do a whole lot with numbers when you go to school. In the, so number three, give in to temptation. Yes. You know those things in your life where you're like, oh, I know I shouldn't do that. I know it's bad for me. I know it's not great for my spiritual life. I know that this, it's, you know, the Bible calls it maybe sin in your life. It, those things that you just resist and you, it's tiring. Just give in. You know, God wouldn't want you to do anything difficult like resist temptation, right? Um, here's what James says. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Death and destruction. That sounds fantastic. If you're wanting to drift from God, doesn't death and destruction sound like the way to go? Like, I would love to just start giving into temptation so that sin plants itself inside me and I'm headed toward death and destruction. That sounds like a plan for 2018 right there. Finally, after you've done all of those things, love the world more than you love God, right? Does that sound like a good plan? The things that you surround yourself, they they might be good things. You you got a hobby. You've got uh, things you enjoy doing. You've got, uh, you know, maybe your kids' activities, All of these things that are maybe good things in the world, good things, make them the ultimate things in your life. Just obsess over everything else but God. 1 John 2.15 says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if the love of the Father is in you, and you're just tired of it, surround yourself with all of the worries of the world. Let everything in your life other than your relationship with God take precedent. Make your priority list and put God at the bottom. Jump into your hobbies head first. Let them take priority. Your kids, your job, if you could, if you could, if you could just work 80 hours a week and ignore your, your family and your kids and your faith, that would, that would really be effective, right? Last but not least, number five, fake it. You can do it, right? I mean, how often in life do we have the need to just fake it, right? 
yeah, I'm here, I'm happy. Somebody comes in and says, hey, God bless you, good morning, welcome to Life Bridge. And you're like, hey, how's it going? Good to be here. You can do it, just put a smile on your face. Act like everything is wonderful, because it's what's on the outside that counts, right? That's what we say. Second Timothy chapter 3 says this, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. This is Paul talking to Timothy again about what will happen in the future. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant. They'll have an appearance of godliness. They'll look right on the outside, but they will deny the power within. Don't worry about being transformed by the power of God. Don't, don't worry about the, the, the substance of your heart. Just do whatever it takes to make people think everything's fine on the outside. Smile, go along with it, do whatever you need to do to just make them feel like it's okay so they can go away and you can get back to knowing uh, that it's not all good with you, right? So when we talk about these five things this way, it sounds silly, right? Neglect your time with God. Hang around the wrong people. Love this world. Just fake it. All of these things. But I bet if you think back, you can think of a time when you've done each and every one of these. And when we're sarcastic about it and we make it so plain, it sounds silly, but we've all done these things as if we were asking for and receiving and following bad advice. It's happened to me before. Not too long ago, I was uh, serving in ministry. I've been in ministry for about 12 years now. Uh, I've gone to, in the meantime, I've worked at several different churches. I've um, went back to school and I've earned a couple of degrees and um, all of these, uh, I, I, I grew up in church, so I've been in church my whole life. Uh, I know what the Christian life is supposed to look like. I know uh, all the right things to say. I know all the right things to do. Uh, if anybody can fake it, I can. And not too long ago, I was in a season in my life where I just started feeling like something was wrong. I could get up on a platform and teach and preach, and I could baptize people, and I could do all of these things. And inside, I would just feel empty about it. Just the passion was gone. And, and, and I didn't really, just kind of like that trip on I-75. I, I found myself in a place that I didn't recognize, and I wasn't sure how I got there, and I wasn't sure what I did. Um, but I knew one thing, so th this has got to change. This is not what it used to be like. So I, I was talking to a friend, a wise friend who I appreciate, and he asked me a question, and it's, it's the question that I want to ask you today. Um, he looked at me and he said, Eric, what are you doing with what God has given you? And he said, God, ha God has given you some amazing gifts. Uh, he's, he's given you a, a heritage of faith, just like Paul was talking about with Timothy, your grandmother and your mother. And I have one of those families that I come from. He's given you that, and he's given you these gifts you, you, you can teach, and you can do all these things. And, and what are you doing with what God has given you, especially your faith? What are you doing with it? And if I was honest in that moment, which I was, I said, not enough, I don't think. I'm not doing enough. As a matter of fact, what I am doing is going through the motions. It doesn't, I don't, I don't feel it anymore. So that's the first question. What are you doing with what God has given you? Maybe you can... Maybe you can honestly say, you know what, I'm on fire right now. Everything's great. I'm doing everything I can to nurture my faith. But maybe, just maybe, you can relate to what I was feeling back then. 
maybe something's missing. So the, the next question I had to ask myself was, just like when I got lost on the highway, what do I need to do to get back on track? Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, tell us this. I have this against you. This is God speaking to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Think back and remember where you've fallen from. And repent and do the works that you did at first. What are you doing with what God has given you? If you could relate to this story and you feel like, man, I might, I might be one of those times in my life where I'm off track. Maybe everything's great for you, but it could get even better. The answer to the tough questions is remember what it was like when it was fresh. That's what I did when I found myself in this spot. I, I remember. I remember, I remember reading the Bible, and it would just come alive, and, and I remember serving in church and how exciting it was, and I remember sharing my faith with others, and, you know, we live in a society where we don't really want to feel bad. We don't want to feel any kind of negative feelings, but the Bible talks about how those negative feelings, it calls it conviction, is not always a bad thing. My encouragement to you today, as we start out 2018, if, th if this is you, lean into those feelings a little bit. I bet if you paid close enough attention, you would find out that it is God speaking, calling you back on track, saying, come closer to me. Repent. Repent just means turn around, re return to the way, rethink, readjust, get back on track and do the things you did at first. Do the things that when you were new in the faith, the things that nurtured your relationship with God. No better time than now as we start a new year to relight that fire. Can I pray with you? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today for this opportunity to come together, to open up your word, and to hear a powerful message straight from your word. Lord, it has nothing to do with who's talking. God, it has everything to do with the fact that it comes straight from your word. Lord, we ask today that as we've read this parable, that the heart, the soil of our hearts would be found to be good soil, that this word would find its way into us, grow roots, grow strong, and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen. Amen.